How's it, Brian? Thanks for joining us. Uh, Brian's from Urban Management. He's going to tell us a little bit about uh, your business and what you're doing and the work that you're doing um, in our metropole and, and the broader KZN region. Uh, Skulk Chenison um, is going to be talking about the work that uh, Devemco is doing in the public sector. And we'll just be talking about the private public participation that's happening in the, in the fantastic trajectory that we've got in the province at the moment. Uh, Brian, just tell us a bit about what Urban Management does. I think it's, it's, it's a concept that's pretty much new to South Africa, but it's really about how do we create really desirable places to live, places to work, and places to invest. And it's, it's really about getting the desirability of experience in a node. So, so we're all about making sure when you drive into an area, you walk into an area, or you paddle into an area, because we're yeah. a coastal area, yes. is that your experience in that place, whether you came in a Bentley or whether you came in a minibus taxi, of your public space, of which must be the same, that must be safe, must be well-maintained, it must be a caring place. And I think that's what we drive, whether it be large economic nodes or whether it be tourist nodes like Umschlonga, Rocks or Benito, it's all about your experience in that space, and that's what we craft across a number of different services that are provided on the ground. And that includes a lot of engagement with the municipalities, of course, who are the ultimate service providers. But we're seeing this theme playing out across the country. Skulk and I have just been to the Sapoa conference. There's 15 major municipalities that have either urban improvement precincts or managed precincts. How are you seeing this trend kind of play out across the country and then kind of bring it back to, to what we're seeing in KZN? Yeah, so I think you know, particularly when we look at South Africa, we judge it purely by the South African lens, but internationally, the notion of precinct management is, is a growing phenomenon because cities in, in reality can't focus at the levels required to create competitive nodes that are, that are well-serviced when they have a very broad growing um, population um, due to urbanization. Yes. So, so the trajectory really is about a lot more collaboration between the private sector between the municipalities, we mustn't forget provincial and national government. They have very, very important yes. roles to play. So we start Absolutely. talking about treasury. Yeah. We start talking about a number of other. So, so really, it's about saying, if we don't work together collaboratively, you're simply not going to be competitive. And I think yes. that's what this is about, is that how do we collaborate together in a structured way um, and a way that's measurable? You know, yes. this is not just about talking. This is yeah. not about the plans we formulate. It's really about execution. How do we deliver on the ground? How do we change the experience for all people in our node? Yeah, I mean, it, we've seen the socioeconomic benefits of getting this right. Um, when we developed in, in, in the Sabaya region, the thousands of people that were drawn into employment, a lot of them permanent positions now, the infrastructure that's gone in, the, the multiplier effect in the economy, I mean, these things work. Uh, but I think it's just about holding each other accountable, both the public and the private sector, um, to get this thing right. Uh, and Skulk, you've had a lot of engagement with city officials of late. What, what are you hearing? Um, from yeah, so, so maybe just to touch on Brian's point there, the, it almost gives a voice to the private sector where the normal person in a household doesn't have time to go and engage with a municipal official. He doesn't understand the whole mechanisms of all, all, how all of that works. So I think Brian and his team play an integral role in bridging that gap between municipalities, delivering services, niche services that the end users want that the municipality initially can't deliver, like landscaping areas, um, cleaning verges, fencing, making security, making all that. So I think that's a, it's an add-on service to the municipality and bridging a lot of different gaps um, that we can fill in, in this country. So I think that's the, almost the, the, the gap that you guys fill. And then further to that is that critical engagement with city, keeping the guys accountable, um, giving advice, assisting where, where we can assist, um, I think the private sector has played a big role, and you guys are instrumental in bringing all that in, all the precincts, giving a proper voice to a lot of people, um, yes. organized voice. And um, we obviously, a lot of the times we get distracted. People have their own agendas. Everyone's trying to create yeah. a situation, um, which I think is a big thing that we're changing now with managed precincts. Guys are actually, everyone's pulling together, putting the right, re right resources together and, and aiming in one direction, um, which I think, it's taken a while to get there, um, yeah. especially in, in the areas we work in, but I think we are there now. We've seen the impetus from local government, um, including provincial government and national government with the presidential working groups to actually form a voice and give a accurate a feedback back to the guys. Because a lot of times, us developers 
are, we, we can't give the guys honest feedback because they are the guys who give us our approvals. So if we do go and say, listen, you guys are not doing great, immediately we're on the back foot. So we need an independent party running in the background, understanding what's going on um, and giving honest feedback and saying, guys, this is not working, this is working. Yes. Um, where sometimes us as developers, we struggle with that part of it and um, yeah. we can't give the guys honest feedback. I mean, Brian, there's power in the collective that if you can have an organized resource who have an understanding on service delivery and are able to pull that with other managed precincts across a region. I imagine that's got a lot of power and a lot of clout when it comes to pulling in the right um, national and uh, regional officials to, to assist at, at municipal level. Well, I think it is. And what it, I think very important, it comes back to the business case. Why is this of benefit to the municipality? What is the underlying reason for collaborating? And I think when we start looking at the municipal revenue streams, rates, um, utilities. Um, so in managed precincts just within the, let's call it the, 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 the greater, the great Durban, quite a Kusa, Belito node, we've got pros approximately 150 billion rand in managed precincts. When you start doing the numbers, what they generate in terms of rates and That's revenue, a massive number. it's a cash cow for the city that very important to allows it to deliver on its so show compact services to those yes. and areas that can't afford it. So really, it's 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 a symbolic re a relationship between that of the city and these managed precincts to say if we can get business to work and get investment to work, if we can improve the quality of life, it's going to drive city revenue. It's yeah. going to assist the city in it's delivering. Grow the path. One hundred percent, you know. And I think that's a very very important part of this. Um, and there's also the, the the discussions around strategic planning into the future. Mm. And I and I think that what managed precincts also bring to be able to sit with the cities and say, well, look, what is our trajectory? Where are we going? What is the bulk infrastructure need? You know, what is the long-term management plan for this? How do we better collaborate, whether it's tracking sewer faults and understanding changes in, in air temperature and then how that may affect sewer yes. flow? And we know we can be proactive in dealing yeah. with some serious challenges. So it's about bringing private sector expertise Together with the city and saying, yes. look, we've got to collaborate, we've got to work. And, and we are, we, we, we've come, and I think, particularly in KZN, we've had the challenge we've had over the last three, four yeah. years. What it's done, it's, it's created a formidable, organized private sector. You start talking about the growth, KZN Growth Coalition, yes. Chamber of Business, the managed precinct voice. And I think it's been very much one of saying, how do we work together? How yeah. do we find solutions to get, look, at times that we don't agree and, yeah. and, and, and we bash heads. But I think at the end of the day, both private sector, organized private sector and municipal's objective is to ensure that we once again retake the position that KZN should have. Eh? Mm. So if that presidential uh, meeting that we had with stakeholders for, for Ramaphosa and uh, Minister Mchunu Water and Sanitation Minister at the time, what what's the momentum that's happened and, and what what actions actually taken place since that meeting? So, so the presidential work team was established by the president back in April on the back of the challenges case at And the real focus is is Etiquin. Um, and there's eight work streams. Um, the first work stream for the city is is what uh, is sustainability. The second is water and sanitation, and I think it highlights the critical importance of water and sanitation. Yes. We were saying beforehand, you know, you can sort out power if you need to. But water is another metal together. And, and I think there's been, um, we meet every second week, there's a program of action um, right now. And the big discussion is, and it's a difficult one around KPIs. Yeah. Because, you know, only when you can track performance, there's accountability and performance. Can, can we, and it, it, it builds confidence with the private sector. Mm. And, and it allows us to see, well, the work that we're doing and we're supporting, because at the end of the day, is the responsible yes. entity. But the trajectory is one that is, compared to where we were even six months ago, yeah. I think we, we really are making material, measurable strides to improvement against milestones that we can actually measure. And I, and I think that's the critical one. And now we sit on like the data and the stats and the certain I mean, we did, uh, you know, it happens. We had a major sewer leak at four o'clock in the morning in Umschlanga yesterday because of a rail got jammed in a main valve. Yeah. But the city came out in the early hours of the morning. By nine o'clock in the morning, it was clear. Yes. And it was a hell of an effort to get that yeah. sort out. It was washed clean. So I think that 
the, the trajectory of improvement, particularly around water yes. and sanitation. Yeah. And we must remember we had the storms, we've had a lot of damage to it. Absolutely. So we have a good trajectory, For sure. and it's very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And Skalk, you've seen the same, and the willingness from city officials and at council level, the mayor getting behind these programs. Yeah, I'll look, talk us through these. I think um, we were obviously at a knife's edge in the elections. A lot of people, there was a lot of uncertainty around the elections as to where it was going to go. Um, a lot of guys stopped engaging prior to the elections because they didn't know where they were standing yes. with all the with with all the political turmoil. Um, but post elections, I have to say, there's been a remarkable change in um, sentiment in terms of municipal official engagement. Um, the mayor is really trying to um, force a whole structure down on everybody, saying engage, solve the problem. However you solve it, solve it. Work together with whoever you need to work together and solve it. So I think. Um, last night we were in a, a meeting with the mayor um, and all the all the deputy city managers, and it was it was amazing to see the feedback and how open and honest the guys were as to what's actually happening. Previously, we've been shut out for years now, um, where the guys didn't want to tell us the true story, um, because they knew the true story wasn't something they wanted to share with everyone. Now the guys are open, saying, "Listen, either way, we have to fix it. Here is the true story. This is where yes. we are. This is what yeah. we can fix. This is what we can't fix." Can you help us fix this while we focus on this? Um, and I think that that's a massive stride forward um, where the guys are being accountable. Yes. They are starting to agree to KPIs and saying, this is, this is what we can do. Let's all work together to, to reach that, that milestone. I mean, our teams have been deployed in water and sanitation. Our project managers, we've given advice. So there's, there's proper participation between the public and private sector now. Um, just sort of drilling down into um, these sort of pockets of excellence um, in the region, and, and we're seeing this out, this play out nationally. How does the role of um, precinct management versus estate management, because they very often are in the same precinct, we see this in Sabaya, you've got various estates within a managed precinct. How do you see those roles overlapping and, and what, the, what is the difference between them? So Brad, I think <clears throat> particularly in Sabaya, we, 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 we in quite a unique node where we have, let's call them secure communities with, with dedicated access control within a broader precinct that in, embraces forest and a number of open access roads. So when we start talking about precinct versus estate, I think estate for most people are very difficult, easy to understand. The job owners yes. associations, sure. access control, you're inside and you, you're subject basically to the rules of the association that come by your MRI. Yes. The precinct management side on the other <laughs> is a lot more challenging because you're dealing with public space, you're dealing with a lot of bulk infrastructure, um, you're dealing with some of the huge challenges around ensuring that there's there's adequate and effective public transport. Yes. Um, you're dealing with issues like policing and bylaw enforcement. So the precinct is saying, well, it's all in well to have a well-managed gated estate, but if you're not taking care of the broader yes. periphery, is that, and you're not ensuring it's safe, secure, work and inviting, Yes. you know, having all the street lights out, means suddenly arriving at a, at, a, at a gated estate and everything works, unfortunately, that, detracts from the value yes. inside of that. Yeah. So what we're saying is that from, from a broader precinct, this is, we're looking after the big picture. We're making sure that the, that the big bulk infrastructure, your overarching experience, your green areas, your, your, your areas that are accessible to all and yes. the econo economics that underpin this yeah. are working. Whereas the estate management, in many respects, has a much higher order level of management within mm. it, Yes, but it's under a much more controlled environment. Yeah. But having said that, both entities work very closely together, okay? So we share, we, we're sharing from a management point of view, we talk to each other, we're often we're sharing, we're sharing security service providers. Yes. It's a completely integrated system. And intelligence. Our intelligence across the entire thing, and also from a cost perspective, because you need scale for efficiency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so economy, uh, so the, 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 the underlying premise is that when you arrive in an area, it's versus your sense of arrival. Nobody knows whether you're in the Sabaya Coastal Precinct, whether you're in where it, th they arrive and they have an experience of yes. Sabaya. And I'm using an example because we're here now. Yes. And that's the overarching thing. For sure. There really shouldn't be a change of experience whether you come off the M4 or if you go through an access control in the gate to whether you walk yes. in the forest down to the beach. Mm -hmm. So it's about it's about managing the experience of people in that space. So they they are separate entities. They have legal different legal structures, yeah. different levy structures, but ultimately 
It's about integrating the two aspects. One, essentially private property management, the other one, public space. And that extends to the communities that surround the precincts, obviously. I'm Schleiti, as an example, you know, gem of KZN. You know, we've been very involved in um, the Smart Village, which is a um, non-profit organization that works with bylaw management, with the with the clean and green programs within Amshloti, because as you say, you can come into Sabai and have this world-class experience. You need to, that needs to be consistent with uh, the areas around it and the natural resources that we've got around us. So, you know, the the work that we've done with with the smart village and with um, security infrastructure that's gone in has made a, a marked difference to the experience of the whole broader community, including um, the communities um, that we draw resources and, and employment from. You can't have these areas of excellence sitting as islands. Yes. In reality, it's understand we need to say how do we how do we expand those levels of management and how do we bring in those that surround us that that particularly those that haven't historically had access to opportunities within yes. these precincts. And there's been a lot of work about uh, done on on creating systems to be able to get those who historically have been outside the opportunity net yes. into the net. Mm. And I think part of that is one is how do you how 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 do you create that working space with neighboring community structures, databases, how, how do you work? And the other is how do we expand what tool do we use to expand this idea of managed precincts? Yes. And I think we're doing quite a lot of work with provincial treasury. I'm part of Sapoa and is on a research project yeah. now we've had engaged with, with National Treasury. The city needs to create an enabling environment to be able to roll out these managed precincts much faster. Cape Town has seized this opportunity. They have um, 52 current, or we call them URPs, urban improvement yes. precincts. Um, the city in Cape Town calls them city improvement districts. They have 52. The, the city precinct alone's budget is just under 100 million rand this year funded by private sector. And a lot of people don't know that when they go to yes. Cape Town. Mm. They have 52. They have 350 million rand of budget coming in, and they've got... They've got 30 online. They have a whole city department. I'm driving it, whereas we're working with Etiquini yes. to get that. Quite a cruise has been amazing, I, I must say, in terms of their support enabling for this. And if you want me to share some brief numbers around what these precincts do for city revenue, it's quite astounding. So we are working at a higher order as well with the cities to say how, whilst we have these managed precincts where, like Sabai, where it's entrenched in Taka Beach, an obligated member, and it yes. works very effectively, how do we retrofit them to our surrounding areas that don't have that entrenched? Because ultimately, it's about getting more organised. Regional efficiencies, mm. yeah. Yeah, and I can also see it on a, on a more of a micro level. A lot of the guys don't understand what happens on a day-to-day -day operational basis. So like sniper cameras, tracking, um, it's linked in with the police so that every single number plate gets tracked, gets flagged immediately in the precinct. Police get informed, they track the vehicle. So it's, it's, a, it's a more of a... It's in it's a uh, macro level, the guys are also managing the precincts um, in between each other with facial recognition, with everything. And that the general public's not even aware of. Um, it just happens in the background. I think that's a lot of the stuff that, that we almost need to discuss and, and bring to light where people actually don't understand about managed precincts, what they actually offer behind the scenes that no one knows about. So you can see the landscape and you can see the street lights, but it's the behind the scenes stuff that really, really add the value, the engagements, the security it brings. and the general policing in the area, the intelligence that we've seen between all the different estates, um, the informants that are in the areas, lots of informants telling us what's happening in the areas where we should watch out for what is happening in the communities. Um, and I think that is a, it's, it's quite a radical thing that I don't think that the, the public as a general understand and, and, and can move forward on. But I think we've been very deliberate about including the communities in all the mm. projects that we've done and the, the impact on these surrounding communities, as I say, in both jobs during construction, but post-construction, we've totally transformed the economy surrounding us and they in turn support us. Um, and I, I just think there's so much positive trajectory around our region, our municipality, our city, um, and we're seeing it at the Sapoa conferences, the SA Council of Shopping Centres. There's such incredible excitement and trajectory around our region. Um, and most, most um, funds, most sort of drivers are underweight on, on our region and KZN. And, and, and I mean, we've seen it in the inquiries that we've been coming through. So we're very upbeat about the value proposition that managed precincts bring 
what we're delivering in Sabaya and you know what as a region it represents for for our clients and and for general stakeholders. Now there's definitely a change in sentiment nationally um, but I think locally is where actually the guys understand. Yes. It's not often where someone from Joburg or Cape Town comes in and are not surprised. Yeah. The the general news in the in the industry is a little bit damning and saying yes. this is this is not ideal and, and all the things that we've gone through in the last three years, yes. the floods, the tornado, the this and that. But the reality of it is it's very different when you actually experience it here. And that's why a lot of us developers are staying around. People keep asking us, why are you still developing in Cape Town? But the guys don't actually see the value until you are here. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I think slowly over time, especially in the next six months to a year, that's going to change. Um, we can see it on the ground changing already, and it's only been three, four months um, yes. after elections. So the guys are, it's, there's real impetus, there's real change. Um, the sewer stuff is getting sorted out. The water issues are getting sorted out. Obviously, it's aging infrastructure. So the guys are chipping away at it. Um, but, but the reality of it is, it is a remarkable province. Climate's incredible. Um, we've had... A lot of bad things happen in a short period of time, um, but that's also made us super resilient. I think yes. us as a KZN, probably the most resilient. We've got a lot yeah. of people that stay here. The retailers are doing really well here compared to the rest of the country. They're trading which better is than anywhere in the country. Trading better. Um, there's a big population here, lots of opportunities here. Um, and and the second biggest GDP in the country. Yeah, and that's why we're sticking around. And I think that turn is going to come quite rapidly. Um, surprisingly, the South Coast is also picking up quite a bit. Um, so, so this whole coastal belt is really um, getting enhanced properly and I think the opportunity is going to get missed by a lot of people because they have a perception in their mind that's different to the yes. reality. Um, so I think there is a proper opportunity and that's why we're here and, yeah. and moving forward on and it. And we're seeing this from corporates. I mean, mm. Toyota and the Doobie Trade Port deploying you know, billions into their new scheme. Um, we're seeing it on the north coast, we're seeing it on the south coast. Um, there's a lot that's happening in, in multiple sectors and arenas. And, you know, we see that there are cycles in, in every industry and in every region, and there's no doubt we're on the, on the up. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I think so, Brad. I think also what underpins this is that <clears throat> from, a, from particularly around this kind of north coast corridor, we have the highest concentration of managed precincts anywhere in the country. And that includes Doobie Trade Court is a managed precinct. Mm. Um, so we have this ability to organize structures to collaborate together. And I think when people look at, you know, where, where you're gonna where you're gonna put your investment in brick and mortar, I think there's a couple of things that you look at. But most importantly, you look into the future. You want security, you want hope that what is there is yes. a plan in place to secure that into the future. And yeah. I think that's where the managed precincts are so powerful is that they give confidence into what you see today is going to get better, not get worse. And I think that's the very big difference. They provide measurable, material, deliverable hope that <laughs> what you're buying into is going to get better. Yes. And I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very powerful message. I think I've, I've had in the last couple of months, I've had, I'm, I, I used to live in Cape Town, I've lived in the Eastern Cape extensively. Um, I chose to make home here. I've got a young family growing up. And it's, you know, you, people don't understand the lifestyle we have on the North Coast unless you've lived here. So we're really sitting on a lifestyle here that honestly, I, I think is second to none. Absolutely. You know, miss Cape Town and, and, and I love Cape Town. It's a great place to visit. Yeah. But from a, from a lifestyle and day-to-day and -day point of view, we're sitting on something very special here. Coupled with the ports and the, and the change that's happening at Transnet and the, the inland um, and the privatization of rail and private rail slots, um, the implementation of inland ports going all the way through to Gauteng, and we're still the gateway into Africa. There's a lot of positive momentum in, in those arenas, and those are all catalysts for growth and, and a proper opportunity for public-private participation. So. And if you just look at the road infrastructure, I went up to, to Maritzburg the other day. I hadn't been up there for a while. And the level of road infrastructure, it's been rolled out from, from King Shaka Airport yes. through down, through Omschlonger Rocks, all the way down through to the into interchange, um, and then up to Maritzburg. There is nothing yeah. in the country That's world like class. What's, been, what's been built there. And it's quick. Yeah. I mean, that transformation the building of that has actually been exceptionally quick and I, I, I mean I know for a fact that there's that level in in the Western Cape and and both the Gauteng has not been rolled out like we currently have in mm -hmm. 
crazy there. And we've got the space here to roll it out. Cape Town, you've got a big mountain. Stuck. There's nothing yeah. you can fix. It is, <laughs> it is what it is. We're here, we've got space, we've got opportunity. Um, we can actually make, make stuff happen here, which is. But I think it's now just about delivery and accountability and, and holding each other accountable and, and um, fulfilling the potential of this region. You know, if, if you look at it from an investor's perspective, like if I was just, if, let's say I was staying in Joburg and I want to invest in, a, in KZN, there's no way I'd invest outside of a precinct that has my best foot forward um, or someone who actually looks after my investment for me. So that, that's the managed precinct model um, that we've been discussing. So I think that's something that people haven't really thought about is like, how do I protect my investment? And that's exactly the avenue you need to protect it. It's a voice of someone who looks after your investment. It's someone who actually challenges the status quo, makes sure that it's going to be sustainable for the next 10, 15 years, um, and also warns you about stuff that is not going well and you can manage your, your yes. risk and your appetite. Um, so I think that's a, that's a shortcoming of the precinct model where people don't explain that to the guys and the guys don't actually understand what, what the guys do. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's kind of the theme of, of this discussion is like trying to educate people as to what the guys actually do and how, yeah. and how they go about it and where the opportunities are across the country. And all the growth is coming out of managed precincts across, across the country. We've seen it in mixed use developments that generally in managed precincts. And that's where even in you know, COVID times and, and, and moving into the challenges that we've had nationally, um, we, we've seen growth out of these regions. So uh, I think we, we're on the right uh, space. So as an example of COVID, so our managed precincts, we never skip one day with the lockdown. We were, had all the emergency classification done. Our team kept on rolling out throughout that entire period. I mean, there were times, it was literally tumbleweed coming down the road, but yes. we were still maintaining the integrity of infrastructure, doing yes. what was right. But I think, you know, it's easy to talk about this and then, but people say, well, what does the numbers tell you? So just, just from a, a numbers perspective, we'll, I'm going to use Belito as an example. So in a five-year period in the, in the Belito commercial nodes where that's located, so it's up in the upper top of Belito for those who know Belito, the, the precinct runs down the hill and it's the beachfront. Just commercial property in a five-year period between valve roles, so valuation roles, yes. city valuation roles. So it wasn't two different valuation roles. It's in one valuation role yeah. because each year they have a supplementary role. In that five-year period, the value in the precinct, the additional investment, both in redevelopment and new property, was at 43%. Okay? That equated to driving city revenue by 127% in that period. And you can put those numbers directly down to investors and some very big ones having the confidence to know that there's organized community structures in place that is, has formal relationship with the city around the long-term management of a node. I mean, we've seen the same thing in Sabah. I mean, Skulk, you actively engage with uh, the, the revenue departments, the CFOs and uh, real estate. And the rates generation in this node has, has been has been uh, an unbelievable contributor to Yeah, you know, like Brian said earlier, the cash cow is the main precinct. It is actually the only thing you can look after. And that provides the revenue to look after all the other communities mm. who, who aren't paying rates. Because the majority of communities aren't paying rates. Because it's either below thresholds or whatever the situation is. So you need to keep the precincts, you need to keep value, you need to keep uh, managing it effectively to be yes. able to drive a city forward. Yes. Um, and and that's, that's key. And, and you can see it's working in Belita. It's starting to work here in Itaquini. The guys are turning it around. Um, they're starting to listen and, and see the model. So it, it actually is working across the country. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's adopt it and roll out the similar principles. Great. Well, thanks uh, for joining us, guys. Um, we look forward to seeing the fruits of all these efforts. It's happening now. Come down and try it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Brian. Thanks, man. Scott. Good. Cool. Cheers, guys.